Okay, so on to the big event. Tonight, uh, we will be doing a beginner's guide to Python backend development for mobile products specifically. Uh, we'll be talking about user authentication, network connectivity, and data storage. And this is our first session, um, and the primary focus will be the overview and best practices. Next. And uh, joining me tonight, uh, we have our data analyst numerator, uh, Shrishti Baish, and Ren will be leading the way. Uh, Ren is an analytics engineer at Pfizer. And then we've also been supported with some of the contact by Marudula Rahate, uh, who's an undergrad student at BITS Palani. And of course, we have Eliza, who is our leader here at Women Who Code Python, and does an incredible job um, developing and cultivating a lot of these events for us. Uh, Ren, would you like to take it away? Or I think there's one more, we'll go over the agenda briefly and then we'll get started. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so tonight's agenda, we'll talk about what mobile programming is and the question of the hour, can you actually use Python for mobile app development? I had never considered it for that, but was very much blown away and been excited to kind of dive in further. We'll talk about the Python libraries for mobile apps. Uh, and what do we mean by best practices? And why is Python used in server-side development for mobile apps? Um, some case studies, I think we could perhaps, I wish we could like play it, do a little survey or post in the chat. If you have any idea uh, what sorts of apps, well-known companies, uh, use Python for mobile app development. We'll go over some case studies and then we'll talk about what is next in this series. And yeah, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Ren. Thank you so much, Hope, for being so thorough in every part of this process. Uh, really appreciate it in all of its ways and Eliza too. My name is Ren. Hi, how's it going? I'm trying to be chill about this, but in reality, I'm actually like panicking. Uh, but I wanted to give a disclaimer that this is a high level view of these questions for the purpose of eventually narrowing it down into our chosen frameworks for session two, and then uh, building that backend connection to a mobile app in session three. So everything here is mostly surface level and it's to be more accommodating to someone who would be new to mobile programming and even Python programming. Uh, but I hope that I provide resources throughout this. And if there are any additional questions, I can provide resources even into the Slack that can go a little bit further into certain questions or certain topics that come up today, because this is still a learning process and I am also still learning. And so if anyone has tips or things that they want to learn more about, I'm happy to scrounge it all up together and, you know, put it out in a new and better way for session two and session three. I'm really hoping that by addressing best practices uh, here, we can also address best practices in the presentation side of this, which is constantly getting feedback from you guys. And also um, in the future, introducing maybe something more interactive for all of us, like recall methods, maybe polls, things like that. So without further ado, I wanna go on and address the first question, which is what is mobile programming? Oh, Ren, I'll briefly interrupt you. Do you wanna do a brief um, intro of yourself? and what you do? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm Ren. I should have said that. That would have been nice. I'm an analytics engineer at Pfizer. I just recently graduated from Fordham University in New York. I'm a born and raised New Yorker. I have a cat named Chicken. Um, he lines my good days and bad days. And uh, yeah, this is a thought experiment turned into a three-part series where I wondered how I could use my Python background to make something for uh, the mobile space or the women who code mobile side of this. I think women who code in general, especially the tracks, have been really influential in me taking on little thought experiments and just running with it. Uh, and that's built me up more to, you know, question things that I didn't think I would question before. And I hope that when I talk about questions here, you guys can feel free to, you know, introduce whatever questions you find compelling too into the chat. So what is mobile programming? It's probably the first part we want to get to. Mobile programming involves making applications specifically for mobile devices. Kind of in the name, we use languages like Java, Kotlin, Swift, tools like Android Studio, Xcode. You could also, I feel like um, 
I should add that you can use React, you can use Flutter as well. Uh, mobile apps can involve designing UI optimized for specific screens, touch base interactions, APIs, backend integration, and integrating hardware components. There are so many different kinds of phones, and there are so many different types of inputs in that way. So next one, why don't developers use Python to build mobile apps? I feel like this should be one of the first questions for like a newbie mobile developer to ask because and for me, I'm coming in from more of a baseline, like computer science based side, CS, my classes use C++ and some Python back in like 2019, even 2020 and 2021. Um, so this, this came up several times when I was introducing um, mobile related concepts to new Python interested people. Um, so I figured it would be easier to go through this by making a pro con list. Should you use Python for a mobile app? Well, the pros are that Python's really easy to use. You have a library of uh, communities. You have libraries and frameworks. For each community, you have a lot of interaction. So you might be transitioning to a new role and you want to use something that you already know. The cons, though, are quite compelling in this case to me, uh, and I hope to convince that to you, too, uh, because there's uh, some performance speed issues in certain situations. You have limited native support compared to Kotlin and Swift. You have limited documentation compared to Kotlin and Swift. Uh, and apps sometimes need to have, not sometimes, for um, the iOS stores, you need to have a minimum amount of native code for it to actually be accepted. So we do have a choice of where to use Python in, in our development process. And as part of the idea of like using best practices, it's important to consider like why we would use a certain language in a certain place. I do want to mention that Kotlin is the native language for Android users and Swift is the native language for iOS users, for people who use Apple. Um, also, the thing about speed, Python is an interpreted language, so it's generally slower than compiled languages like Java or Swift, and that's a very top-level assessment of it. There are so many nuances to that statement because it can depend on why you're using Python. People, for example, when they're in like um, the stock market space might never use Python for, for their purposes uh, in terms of like rolling out material uh, because of some kind of like bitwise operation manipulation thing. Uh, there, uh, you can affect certain app features and the speed of them. When, and, and that can require a lot of processing power or memory when you're using Python. Python also doesn't have the same level of native support. I mentioned that, but I wanted to introduce the idea that like limited documentation is available compared to using Kotlin and Swift when you're using Python for a mobile space. I'll go into that in the next slide. Um, a side note about the whole app needs to have a minimum amount of native code is that uh, there, there is like a rule at, in the Apple App Store that uh, the guideline is specifically that like you need a quote minimum amount of native code and it may not have quote may not have access to APIs or frameworks for which compliance with the App Store review guidelines is not possible. So they want to be able to check your APIs and that's a big deal because you use a lot of APIs in order to, to um, use Python, use all languages. Uh, all right. So enter the libraries that people would typically use if they wanted to use Python out of spite for mobile development. Now, if you look this up, it's normally Kivi and Beware that's brought up usually in these situations. Um, can you still make the app? My answer would be, yeah, you can, but should you? Because for Kivi, Kivi is an open source Python framework. Uh, it's used for developing multi-touch applications. It, it says it offers a natural user interface framework and supports multiple platforms. And that always, see, it seems that for senior engineers in the mobile space, that rings a few bells because when it says that it supports mul uh, multiple platforms, including Android, iOS, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, it's hard to be good at all of them. So although Kivi enables uh, mobile app development with Python, it's also not as widely adopted as 
native development frameworks. Another one you could use is Beware. It's a collection of tools and libraries that allow you to develop native user interfaces on Python. Uh, it provides a way to write code once in Python and deploy it on multiple platforms again, um, including Android and iOS and things like that. Um, they are not as commonly used as native development frameworks or cross-platform frameworks like Flutter or React Native. And this is primarily due to performance limitations and the robustness of native development frameworks like um, Kotlin and Swift. Uh, imagine having Google level money thrown at um, something like the at Android Studio support and towards Kotlin. There is a lot of funding given towards those native systems, whereas for Python libraries, it's really just open source. It's really just people kind of tinkering things out and showing you what works. Um, so given the wide differences in funding, you can imagine what a wide difference there is in terms of documentation and what works and what bugs could come up. Um, so for that reason, uh, we could ask ourselves, like, you know, is it better? Uh, which one would you want to use more? Which one um, would be easier to use for you? Or um, perhaps for argument's sake, and maybe even out of spite, you want to continue to use Python. That's that's an option. You can do that. Um, so essentially, my uh, my TLDR of this, my answer to this is, can you still make it? Yes. Should you? Depends on what kind of question and goal you have in wanting to make an app. Um, and this would beckon the question of why exactly Python would be better for other things, if not for the entire development cycle. So yes, this is the this is my way to say you can, but is it worth doing and does it make sense for your goals? So what are best practices here then for making Python, for, for putting Python in your products? Well, I want to define best practices first. Best practices are procedure. Um, that's shown by like research and experience to produce optimal efficient results, right? That's established as like a standard or suitable thing for widespread adoption. It Best practices can still depend on the data we have and the goals for the product itself. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we broadly understand our options in Python development in the mobile space. And I think it's important to focus on industry level examples of people using Python for a mobile product every day. And that's where and we enter into the side of server-side development, back-end development. Many companies use Python for server-side development, but why? Also, I should have mentioned that any kind of questions, if you have any, um, I would be happy to answer them near the end. There's a, a lot of words I would introduce in this session um, at a high level. So I hope to just kind of like get through all of them as we, as we go along towards the end in the Q&A side. Um, so the biggest things, that are a pro for Python and server-side development are, of course, that it's scalable, it's faster to write, and there's a lot of integration. Um, and one second, just moved ahead. Server-side development, though, refers to development of backend infrastructure that supports the functionality of, a, in this case, a mobile app. So when it comes to scalability, mobile products need a backend infrastructure to handle user authentication, like we mentioned in the introduction of this uh, talk, data storage, other server-side tasks, like even analytics. Python scalability is undeniable and well-known at this point, but I'll even prove it to you. And support for high-performance computing makes it a popular choice for building scalable server-side applications that can handle large amounts of traffic. You can also rapidly prototype on Python. Python's a high-level language with a simple syntax and that makes it really easy to write and read code and that can be beneficial for a lot of like making simple quick things quick fixes for server side components of mobile products allowing developers to quickly test and iterate of course integration is a big deal with python it has a strong support for integration with other languages um c++ uh, like it works with python really well um and that makes it easy to iterate with other technologies legacy tech commonly used in mobile product development. So with mobile product development, especially on the front end, a lot of people use JavaScript. I should also mention React Native and way more actually um, than those. So here are some popular mobile products that use Instagram. Our case study uh, that use uh, Python, my bad. Instagram is super well known for liking Python a lot. They show up to PyCon all the time and talk about how much they love Python. 
Um, we know about how much they use uh, Python from senior engineers showing up every year, but uh, just as like a brief overview, Django is heavily used to build and maintain core functionality on Instagram. Instagram employs Python libraries like NumPy and SciPy for data analysis tasks and image recognition and content recommendation systems. Um, in 2017, they mentioned that they migrated uh, all of their Python code base from 2.7 to 3. That takes a lot of time, energy, investment. So that can suggest to you that Instagram is in it for the long haul with Python. And um, I highly recommend if you're interested more in this topic and how Instagram uses it, that you watch um, the PyCon 2017 video with Lisa Guo um, and Hui Ding. And uh, they all, they gush all over, they explain like they, they pretty much let everything loose when it comes to uh, their industry level secrets about Python because they explain how it's used at such a large scale. Um, they they mention integration. They mention how they used Redis for caching and RabbitMQ for message queuing. Instagram uses uh, machine learning, the, the Python's machine learning capabilities for content moderation, spam detection, image recognition, as mentioned. Um, they also use testing frameworks like unit test and PyTest. And the framework for Instagram relies on a Python-based tool like Celery for distributed task scheduling and management. So all across the board, Instagram, big fanboy, fan, fan people for Python. Here's a picture of some stuff that I took from PyCon. Um, the myth that Python is too slow for large scale systems, they tried to debunk during their talk. Um, IG mentions that our bottlenecks are mostly due to development velocity, not code execution. And that might be a lot of words. So just to go into what that means, development velocity is suggesting that they, you know, write more code. And that is the issue is testing that code and make sure it's ready for production. Um, the code processing is not the bottleneck for them here. So they have saved um, a lot of memory, a lot of CPU space. And um, the little picture on the right side over here are some of the tools that they've made using uh, Python. The, I also recommend um, that folks read the Instagram engineering blog. Uh, IG teams have made a lot of strides in explaining how they use Django to improve large scale systems um, and, and, and how they use Django in their workflow in general. Another case study would be Google. So Google uses Python similar to Instagram in all of their spaces. I just showed a picture of G Suite here and some of their open source frameworks, open source projects that use Python intensively. Of course, mentioning talking about Python and Google would not be right if I didn't mention machine learning in all of its ways and how many strides they've made over the last few years alone in, in improving that sector. Actually, the creator of Python, Guido Van Rossum, made a talk in 2017 about how Google, well, in part, he explained a bunch of improvements to Python, but he also mentioned that um, Google uses Python at scale and used Google in a bunch of examples. And I highly recommend that people go see it. Um, the next slide is actually going to have a bunch of people and resources to, to look at if you're curious more on how Google uses Python more. Um, to do a brief rundown, Google uses it for all the machine learning things along with NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, PyTorch is employed uh, for training models that power lots of Google services. They use it in Google Search, Google Photos, Google Translate. They use it for, they use Python for internal tools and automation like from small utility scripts to large scale art automation frameworks. Uh, once again, they use it for prototyping, quality assurance. They use PyTest and Selenium along with tools for code coverage. And they're all leveraged to ensure that, you know, Google's products are, are stable and reliable. They use it a lot for API services. So Python is used to develop APIs and microservices that power a lot of Google stuff. So these services communicate with each other and form the backbone of Google's distributed architecture. So if you're ever looking to make um, APIs and follow a Google solution through it, usually they recommend Python the entire time. Uh, Python frameworks like Flask and FastAPI are used to build scalable apps. Yeah, of course, 
scaling is also going to be mentioned here because that is uh, that is like the main thing that Google wants to push here because um, it it has a lot of integration as well with legacy systems. I think I've mentioned a lot about scaling, so um, I will skip that for now. But if you ever end up seeing like what Google engineers do on a day-to-day -day basis with legacy code, you might see that some of them still use C and C++, um, but it integrates easily with Python. So that is when they open up opportunities for performance optimization and leveraging existing code bases. And this hybrid method could be beneficial when working with computationally intensive tasks or interacting with low level system components. So here are more resources if you're curious. I will paste them into Slack as well. So I hope you guys join the Slack channel or all the Slack channels. Maybe I'll put it in general. What do you think, Eliza? Uh, let's keep it to the Python Android web dev. Oh, okay. like it's about, I'll post it into the chat. Yeah, because like I think general is just more focused on when you go events. But I think it's a great idea like to share the, these links and the slide deck after. Yeah, yeah. great job. Uh, when it comes to iterating this, like it, or uh, in practicing the system of best practices for uh, PowerPoints, I think that for the future, I will totally implement more like pop quizzes and things um, to make this more interactive and, and implement more active recall and things like that. So I do want to mention what could be coming next, which is that next time we're going to talk about recapping some basic stuff that we spoke about today. We're going to talk about setting up the development environment and tools required to build that backend framework with Python. Um, maybe you guys have heard of Postman, things like that. Um, definitely Jupyter Notebook. Then we're going to understand the structure and components of a mobile app um, and briefly talk about what design structure we're going to use or what that even is, because it gets mentioned a lot in mobile spaces. And then uh, we're going to talk about choosing the right framework. And here, um, we're going to speak about like a word on our, our choice for this series, which is going to be from Kotlin to a Python-based system.